Real world data isn't always pretty. Join me today as we learn to deal with troublesome data. Hi, I'm Gregory Talkwine with GNT Learn. And on this episode, I'm gonna help you pre-process some complicated data. Now, previously we did some work with this messy housing price data set. We did some exploration, we did some cleanup, and we ultimately figured out what features we wanted to use. Today, we're gonna to complete the process and transform this glob of data into a suitable model input. Last time we started the process of dealing with the messy inputs of this housing price data set. We've already done a lot of work, so let's take a moment to look at what we've already done, make sure we understand what's going on before we start stepping into new things. One of the first things we did last time was look at the different data types of our variables, or our columns, and discovered that we can't just rely on them blindly to make a decision about whether something is categorical or continuous. Instead, we had used additional information provided in a separate text file and a little bit of investigation through things like histograms to make sure we were allocating continuous versus categorical correctly. From there, we went ahead and selected a few columns to use for categorical and continuous and set those down explicitly in a list for convenience. From there, we were then able to do some additional investigation of what was going on with the particular variables. And we noticed, for example, that the basement exposure had some missing values or NAs. And these NAs, in this case, corresponded to houses that did not have a basement. Likewise, we continued additional investigations. And we looked at some additional useful tools, such as using pandas.cut in order to convert a continuous variable to a categorical variable. In this case, we took the year built and discretized it into a set of different ranges of years in which houses were built. With these various tools in hand, we then were able to construct for ourselves this a very helpful function that really gathered together all these ideas in the one place called clean data. So inside of this clean data function, we are applying five notable data transformations. First of all, we're taking the basement bathrooms and we're collapsing the cases of two or three basement bathrooms into a single category. Second, we are resolving that issue where the NA values of basement exposure need to be filled in with a no basement label. Third, we're going ahead and creating an additional column called year bind built from the year built column that uses that transformation of continuous to categorical. Four, we're taking the garage area, which can be zero, and using that information to tell us whether or not there is a garage at all, thus creating a binary column. And then fifth, we're using np.log to convert both of the lot area and the sales price columns into logs of their own values. Now the last of these is the most remarkable. By changing a variable to a log of itself, we're short of changing the interpretation. This is most impactful for the target variable, where by doing this, we are instead of having a model that's going to minimize the absolute value of our errors, it's going to minimize the relative values of our errors. In other words, a $10,000 error on a cheap house is more important percentage-wise than a $10,000 error on a big house. Now, this is a lot of different little transformations we've gone through here. And for the full details and explanations of all these parts, please refer back to the previous video. For now, we've written all the cells, so let's go ahead and continue on. So now that we've gone ahead and cleaned the data, or apparently cleaned the data, we're going to go ahead and convert our categorical variables into a space that we can actually use them to fit models with. This means encoding them into a binary representation. Now, there are a couple ways to do this. First one we're going to look at is pd.getDummies, which will take a data frame and automatically for itself, by default, decide which columns are continuous and categorical and take the continuous ones as is and then convert the categorical variables to this one hot representation. For those unfamiliar, a one hot representation means taking a column such as basement exposure, looking at all possible values it has, AV, GD, etc., and splitting it into multiple columns where all values are zero except for the one that corresponds to the value it had. So it's one hot value, the rest of them are zeros. This is a way of taking any arbitrary categorical representation and turning it into a dense numeric representation that can be fed into a model. Now, we just went through a whole discussion about how trying to automatically identify these things is maybe not the best idea. So we don't really want to rely on the pd.getDummies ability to automatically choose for us. In fact, we look here, we'll see that by default, it decided there is 52 columns on the output based on which ones it split and which ones it didn't split. If we go ahead and do this ourselves, we can see that we can use the call types for our categorical columns. 
and run this to say exactly which columns we think should be categorical. Now, when we do this, we see now we have 48 columns. And, oh, okay, there we go. Looks like it's pretty good. Except if you were observant, you want to notice a small issue back at the front end here, which is year bind. This is a column that we created. Remember, we binned together the different years in which the houses were built. So we had a continuous variable, but we created a categorical variable. So because we created that categorical variable, it doesn't let, exist in our initial columns type list of categorical columns. So we need to make an update to this. We need to come back here, and we need to add a new category. Because instead of having continuous variables and categorical variables, we now have something that, yes, it's a categorical variable, for the purposes of doing our encoding, but wasn't a categorical variable for the purposes of our pre-processing. So I'm gonna call this gen cat for generated categorical variables. And we really just have one variable to put in there right now. Um, and as always, it's a great idea when you're dealing with names to rather than make mistakes in typing, to go ahead and just copy and paste the exact name you wanna use whenever possible. So let's go ahead and grab that column name, bring it up here and add it to our little dictionary. And now we start to see the value of having this dictionary, that instead of having just different lists of columns or trying to remember in the specific context which columns are categorical and continuous and writing it all out, I have one centralized location where that information is stored. This is my categorical columns, this is the categorical columns I generate later on, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's another one we also generated later on, which was this generated binary or variable, and I'm calling this genby. And this variable was whether or not we had a garage. So let's go ahead and grab that column name as well. And that was called has garage. Right? And so this is a value of 0 or 1 that we created based on the continuous inputs. Strictly speaking, a binary variable is a continuous variable in some sense because it's 0 or 1, so you can do math with it. It will work as is. But we are going to be maybe a little more careful. So I'm going to call this a binary variable because there are cases where you'd want to use it one way or another. All right, so now we have our column types updated. Let's go ahead and run that and make sure to fix the typo with the comma at the end. And then we're going to come on down and not have our column types be the categorical columns alone, but the categorical columns that we initially started with, as well as those we generated at a later date. And because call types is a dictionary of lists, we can just add together two lists to concatenate them into a longer list and run that here. And we see actually we get back 52 columns, which is exactly what pd.getDummies did originally. So it actually did an excellent job. But you don't want to just blindly test, trust that. All right, so we have this representation. And now we have something we could theoretically fit into the model. However, we have one fairly major problem. This works for the training set. What about the test set? Well, OK, you could take the test set. You could do pd.getDummies. However, what's going to happen is that the column names here, this you know, AV, AV, GD, MN for basement exposure, is based upon what values get dummies saw in the column. What if it sees a different set of values in the training set and the test set? Most commonly, this will happen because the training set is usually much larger than the test set. The test set may just not have every single value tested out. And because of that, you'll end up having a different number of columns because the pd.getDummies won't create a column for something it doesn't see. So we really want to only do this choice of encoding and planning once. Now, theoretically, there's a workaround here. You could concatenate the training test set, do the get dummies, split them back apart afterwards. There is some reasons you might want to do this, though it's a little bit messy. But the more preferred method in general is to use a actual tool from something like sklearn that understands how to train an encoder and then use it multiple times. So to do that, we go to option two, which is to use sklearn to do our encodings. Now, from sklearn, we need to do some imports to this. So we're going to say from sklearn.preprocessing, we're going to import three different types of encoders. There's an ordinal encoder. encoder a one-hot encoder, and a label encoder. And these all behave very similarly. Go ahead and run that, make sure everything loads properly. And we can come on down and actually use our label encoder, is we can first define an encoder, 
And this is much like how most of the things inside SKLearn work, where you initialize the instance of the class for it. They would then go ahead and fit that instance based on data. And then you can use the dot transform method multiple times in order to get results for your fit and your for your uh, training set, test set, etc. Now this is going to have a little bit of a problem as is. Strictly speaking, this did run, but it did something a little bit crazy. And to understand why, we first talk about what the encoder is doing. By default, it's taking the information in and doing this one-hot expansion. Now, this one-hot expansion could, in theory, be gigantic. Here we saw above it was 52 columns, but it could be much larger. Because of that, by default, the encoder returns a sparse matrix representation. And this sparse matrix representation has inside of it a, basically the definition of a large array of zeros, and then it just explicitly specifies which values are non-zero. In this case, though, it went a little crazy. It made 3,935 columns, and only 20,000 of those were ones, so it's a very good thing that it used a sparse representation to store this data. However, that's not what we were expecting to get. We were expecting 52 columns. What happened here is the one hot encoder is not doing some sort of selective choice about which columns to encode as categorical or not. It's encoding everything that you give it. We gave it DF train. It had some number of initial columns, and every single one of those columns was encoded, including what should have been continuous variables. So we only want to give it the categorical columns in order to encode. So before we call this, we could inline here, go ahead and put open square bracket and specify the columns we want, etc. It's perhaps a little bit cleaner to do this more verbosely up here and instead to find a DF train categorical where we split off the categorical from the continuous variables initially. So this is going to be call types cat plus our call types gen cat again. Right. And we do the same thing for the training and for the test. Now for the continuous, continuous variables, we want to do something similar as well. We want to have a DF train continuous. And we have to deal with the question of how we're going to handle that binary case. Right? So it depends on what you're going to do for your actual scaling value. In this case, it'll turn out we're going to do exactly the same thing for um, the binary that we're going to do for the continuous. So we can just have a single split here, and we'll see what that is a little bit later. Right? But in this way, we split the data into different subsets based on what kind of treatment it's going to receive. These are going to receive a categorical treatment based on making a one heart representation, and we'll have a scalar later on for the continuous variables. So we can go ahead and run that and come on down and switch this to using the categorical instead. And that will now give us a more reasonable result of now 43 columns. Again, this is only the categorical columns. This above contains the continuous columns as well. And so now we have a sparse representation that is everything we want. Now this sparse representation itself is actually a really handy way to to move around large amounts of information, especially when there's mostly zeros. Now, some models and different tools will work with these sparse matrices, and if it does, you should use them. However, a lot of things won't, and so commonly enough, you're going to have to expand this back to a dense representation using two dense. Right. Now, this is something to be a little bit careful of. A lot of things that create dense representations, or rather, create sparse representations, do it because they know they can be overwhelmingly large in memory if they're in a dense form. So sometimes this too dense will just not be something you can do, uh, in which case you need to use tools and different systems that can handle those sparse inputs rather than dense inputs alone. When we do the too dense, we get bunches of ones and zeros, which looks just like the ones and zeros that we're generating up here. And in fact, you can even see it's the same order. You get 001, 001, 010, 010. Because the encoder is doing effectively exactly the same thing, as they get dummies, uh, in part because we gave the columns also explicitly, so in the same order. All right, so now 
the whole point of this is that we want to handle the test data as well. So let's do one thing here. Let's go ahead, let's go ahead and call this xtrain categorical. And then we'll do an x test categorical. And use the same overall syntax. Yeah, test cat or two dense. And we're going to have an error. And this error will be a value error because we have an input of NA in our test set. So how did that happen? How did we get an NA in our test set? Well, if you remember, we were looking at all these evaluations to see what we wanted to do to handle these missing values, etc. And we we're always looking at the training set, never the test set. And that is the appropriate thing. When you're doing an evaluation, you want to hold out the test set. It needs to be something you don't look at. It doesn't inform your decisions about anything you're doing because it's supposed to be a truly independent test. But then you have this problem. What happens when there's an NA value in the test set that doesn't have an equivalent sort of behavior happening in the training set? Now you have to make some sort of decision about how do you clean up the test set without looking at it? And there's really three options available. Either you can just throw away the ones that are messy from the test set that you couldn't see. Option two is you can make the best decisions you can blindly. And option three is that you can just, well, cheat, frankly, and look at the test set and decide how to clean it up on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, that last option is generally the, the worst from a theoretical perspective, but it is one that you can end up doing sometimes. Well, we don't also want to throw things out. We could throw things out. That's, a, that's kind of the trivial answer. So let's try to do the hard one, which is fix it as best we can without actually looking. Well, to do that, we can do something relatively simple. We can do df test.info and just look at a high level what's going on. And we can see that there's actually three different columns that are missing values. One is the MS zoning, one is the total basement square footage, and one is the garage area. The MS zoning is missing some variables, and this is the one causing the errors currently because this is the one that's categorical. We'll come to the continuous ones in a little bit. So how are we going to handle these? Well, the short answer is it's actually not so much of a problem for categorical variables. For categorical variable, it's actually pretty straightforward. We can just do a dot fill in a right here of unknown. And what we're saying is, okay, this is just a new category that didn't exist inside the training set. Now, it could be that even if we didn't have NA values, this still could happen. You could have a case where you're training on data that's for 11 months of the year, and there's no data from December. December appears in the test set, and suddenly you have an unknown category. This reasonably happens all the time. So this is something you should be used to. And so getting a NA value is also a reasonable thing to say, OK, yep, a new category comes up. It's just that this NA needs to be treated as an unknown for our purposes. So half the solution is just to, for categorical variables, fill in A's with some new name that won't collide with anything else. Now, it's important here that I've already looked before and made sure that unknown is not the name or a value in any of the categories. Or else you'd have a collision, and you'd be assuming that NA's are the same as some existing unknown category. So that said, if we run this, we're going to run into a slightly different error now. OK, this error is the error saying, all right, well, we accept that unknown is a totally new category. Uh, so what do we actually do with it? Well, the label encoder, by default, errors when it says this. It says, maybe there's something wrong with data. You need to look at it. Most often, the way you want to do this is you want to handle unknowns by ignoring them. What ignoring them does, in practice, is it says that, oh, we're trying to build a one-hot encoding. Well, let's just give it a all zero encoding instead. The zero encoding, then, is just like a one-hot, except that, well, it's neither you know year bin, this one, this one, this one, or this one, or this one. It's just not any of them. So it's just all zeros. And that is technically true. It is, they were not any of those bins. So that's a perfectly reasonable way to handle those unknown categories. Or if it's not the year bin, whatever variable you may have. So in this way, we can use the encoder, the one hot, to fit our data and then do the transformation based on what categories and information existed on both the training data and the test data in a self consistent way. Great. Now, this is really the two options for building our one hot encoder. The are other tools out there for doing this. Now, sklearn is just one of a myriad of tools that has a one-hot encoder functionality built in.
Uh, this kind of functionality is all over the place and really every major package that does a lot of machine learning work has their own particular flavor of this. Uh, and the syntaxes vary based on those packages, but the general idea is always the same. Besides the one hot encoding, there are two other variations of encoding that we just pulled in earlier. We pulled in ordinal encoding and we pulled in label encoding. Now, we're going to go ahead and just take a brief aside here and look at the label encoder for a second. And they're very similar in syntax to what we've just done. So I'm going to go ahead and just do some copy paste here. So for the ordinal encoder, encoder without this optional argument, we can see that it's going to have the overall same setup where you define the encoder, you give it the training set, you can then do a transformation on that training set. And we go ahead and run that. We'll see it produces an output like this. So whereas the one hot encoder had the job of expanding the data into this one hot representation of ones and zeros. This is sort of a halfway step. It says that I'm going to look for each of the input columns, see how many different variables exist, and then give them a name, or rather a number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and just give those numbers for them. This representation here is something that is a pretty efficient way of representing the same information that could then later on be expanded into something like the one hot representation. The value of this here is that it is a very common format. And again, there's going to be a lot of tools that use it directly. That said, it is not something that you can just plug in as a numerical input itself. right? You don't want to take 5 versus 24 and use those as, as raw inputs that get multiplied. You need to be using this with something that takes an ordinal input and uses it to build internally something that works like a one-hot representation or does the math that is equivalent to that. So it's not something you're probably going to use as directly with sklearn and sort of these basic tools here. It is something that's much more common though when you're doing something in an SQL or PySpark environment where you need to have a huge amount of information encoded in an efficient way and there are models built to ingest it in this efficient form and use it. So we're not going to be using this here today. And then the last one is label encoder, which is just like ordinal encoder, except that it is only designed to take a single input rather than multiple columns of inputs. And the reason for that is that label encoder is specifically intended to be used for a target variable rather than for a set of input variables, but functionally is the same other than the fact that it won't it'll only take a single value. So that said, we're going to be using the one hot encoder for building a little model today with this data. So let's go ahead and delete this because we don't want to do that. And we also reuse the variable name encoder here. Um, so it would be safer just going to restart and run all of this. Right. Now, the next thing we need to deal with is we still have those NA values in the floats, or rather the continuous variables that we didn't fix. And so we see the TF or DF test info again in just a moment we'll see that we still have to deal with this basement square footage and garage area. Now, again, we have to deal with the inconvenience that this is in the test set. And so if we want to fix it in the best way possible, we kind of have to cheat. So we're going to do something a little more naive and make a reasonable guess. So the reasonable guess I'm going to make here is that the total basement square footage is NA because it was supposed to be zero. But because there's no basement, somebody filling out a form simply left the square footage blank or put NA down instead of zero. And that's the problem we have. So that being the case, we're just going to add a little piece in here that says the column equals raw DF of the column, for this case, with a fill NA of zero. And we need to do the same thing for the garage up here as well, which we already have pulled out separately. So we run that, we go forward and run our pieces. Hopefully we'll now see in our DS test info that we no longer have missing values. So we can go ahead and be done with this DF test.info. So we've gone through, we have our categorical variables ready. Let's get our continuous variables ready. To do that, we're going to have something that again looks fairly similar, except that we're going to do scaling instead of an encoding. So coming back up here at the top, we're going to say from learn, again, pre-processing, we're going to import standard scalar and the min max scalar. 
And notice this is scaling the values. So it's a scale er, er, that we are scaling the values, it's the form of the verb, as opposed to a scalar, as in ar. You go ahead and run that, and we can import our scalars, and we can come on down. And much the same way, we can say a scalar is going to be equal to one of the scalars. We're going to go ahead and use the min-max scalar today because we already have a one heart representation. So we thought things encoded zero to one. So it makes sense to keep things in the same range. We take we fit our scalar to the training data, in this case, the DF train continuous. And we go ahead and do our transformations. And let's go ahead and write this out. DF train continuous equals Scale up transform df train continuous and the same thing for the test and all this is going to do is scale the values in a zero to one scale and that looks consistent with what's been going on with the encoding so there's really not much to show there and now that we have the pieces in those categorical and the continuous ready we can glue them together using np.concatn8. Where we take the train set from our categorical variables, the training set for our continuous variables, and put them one after the other column-wise by saying axis equal to one. Do the same thing for our test set. And we also want to get our y values for the training set as well. Now for the y values, we didn't have to do any sort of special transformation, no one-hot encoding, no min-max scalar. So we can just go ahead and grab the values from the cleaning output directly. We did do a transformation of them in that cleaning output, but we can go ahead and just grab that directly. Targets dot values and from there, we can go ahead and run our code, and we have all the values available to now train a model with. Now, that said, when we did this in a somewhat manual fashion, we split the data apart. We took some data to go down the road of encoding, some data went down the road of doing a scalar, and we glued it all back together at the end. There is another way of doing this. It's a little bit more automated form, and that is using the pipeline class inside of sklearn. It's essentially the same logic, except that what you're doing is you're defining it the set of operations to go one after the other rather than directly doing them yourself this is something that scales very well and looks a lot more like how major big throughput production systems work it is also a little less intuitive to people who are getting started with the data science so it's a little, a little nicer just to do it manually at first and get used to what you're trying to do in terms of the pieces and then think about turning and using something more powerful like a pipeline later on the pipeline tool also has the ability to be generalized to do arbitrary operations. So for example, we had to do this log transformation of our Y values. This is something that we did in the cleanup rather than as part of our transformation work. You could do it in a pipeline, but requires definition of a custom class to be handed over to do that. So we didn't want to get into something too detailed in terms of the exact syntax there. And also importantly, that pipeline tool in sklearn is very nice. But if you actually are doing something at scale like that, you're going to tend to be using some different system, a PySpark or what have you, and they're going to have their own system for handling these sort of pipelines of things. Using that system well is a pretty much a topic unto itself and a topic for another day. For today, though, we have some values. Now, there is one problem that was created along here, and somewhat unfortunately, there's no error message that's going to come up because of this mistake that we've made. It's just something subtle in the data, and this is where sort of the scary side of machine learning kind of comes in for data processing. Let's go back up here and look at some of the data we created in a little more detail. Well, one of the columns of data we created was this value of, you know, taking the basement exposure, if it's NA, saying, oh, there must be no basement, right? So we did that. Let's take a second glance at that idea. So basement exposure And we said is NA, and then there's some number of values for that. And if we look at the data, 
you see there's 38 instances where there was an NA there. And so, okay, there's no basement. Fine, makes sense. However, there's another column that contains exactly that same information. Specifically, the column we're using is a total basement square footage. So if I instead say, look at the raw values and pull up the total square footage of the basement, so total basement square footage, equal equal to zero, and then just count how many times that happens. There's 37. The input data is inconsistent, right? There's something just fundamentally wrong. Either somebody wrote down the wrong square footage, or more likely, somebody put an NA for basement exposure when they should have put no basement exposure because there was a basement but didn't have exposure. Now, we could try to look at other variables and massage everything and figure out what the best way to fix this broken data is. But at the end of the day, we're never going to really know. We just know that somebody along the way or some processing step that came from the raw data didn't do something correctly, and there is an inconsistency with the data. And what's a little bit scarier about this is this could happen in the test case as well, and it would have been even less visible to us. So, well, can we maybe examine this, see if there's something we can do about it specifically? Okay, we can take a little glance. So in the training set, easily enough, we can go ahead and grab these two different pieces. So we can grab this is an A and do a XOR between that and the values for the number of places where it's zero. And this will give us a list of true and false values for whether or not there's an inconsistency between these two. Okay. And we can do raw df train to look at the specific column of data that has this problem. And a little side note here, we have to watch parentheses to get this to behave correctly. Um, one thing to be careful about in sort of the order of operations is that when in doubt, when you're using a operator that you don't normally think about what order of operations it has in terms of does equals equal evaluate before or after the XR operator, put parentheses to make sure you don't have an issue. So we see our one row that had a problem and we could try to dig through this and try to understand what's going on. Or we can simply say something's weird here rather than try to be smart and fix it. Let's just not train on this. And one way to do this is to grab this index value that it has and go back up to where we are doing our data cleaning and say, you know what? This is just bad data. Let's call this bad terrain index, actually. And we'll make a list of all the bad terrain indexes we find. And there are other ones in this data set, I assure you. And we'll just make a note for ourselves. So basement square foot inconsistent. Consistent with the basement exposure. And then what we can do here on this line is simply add dot drop bad train index. And that way we can simply throw that piece of data out and not include it in our work. And this will be totally fine going forward. Now, that piece of code runs, it's fine. The scary thing here is how would you have ever found that? And the answer is, by just poking around the data, by just noticing that, oh, there's two different columns that contain information that kind of means the same thing, and seeing if there's an issue there. The way I originally discovered it was just because I was going to try to demonstrate that, oh, there's a relationship between these variables, and so I was going to show that every time the basement square footage was zero, the basement exposure was at A. And then it turned out that that wasn't actually the case because there was an inconsistency in the input. And there's no reason to think that that would be the case beforehand, but sometimes it happens. And you can't always catch these kinds of things. Having caught this specific one, we could go another step further. We could, as part of the cleaning, put a check in here and see if that happens. We don't put it inside of our data frame or do something like that. And that would help catch it in the test case as well. But this becomes a very long road of trying to fix little weird things. And this data set, to be honest, has a lot of little issues like this which makes it a very interesting data set to dig into further. For the moment, we're going to go ahead and just get rid of these two little pieces and leave 
this year for future reference. But our solution is that when we have some bad data to identify it and remove it. And the scary, terrible thing is there was no way, there's no error message, there's nothing that was ever going to tell us that that was wrong. All right, so now that we have some data. Let's go ahead and just do a kernel restart and run all, make sure everything is where it needs to be. And we can go ahead and actually just make a quick model to demonstrate what's going on here. So to that end, we're going to go up to the top and do a real quick import and just say from sklearn.linear underscore models import lasso and see if it's actually linear model or linear models. It is actually a linear model. And come on down and build ourselves a model. Now, the syntax for building a model in sklearn is something that's been talked about in other videos. But again, it looks at just like the scaling and the encoding syntax, where we define the instance, we do the fit. In this case, we fit the x train and the y train. And then we can go ahead and get predictions. Here, we're going to make a note and call them log preds, because as you remember, we did a log transformation of our y variable. So what we're actually predicting is not the sales price, but the log of the sales price. All right. So our actual prediction is the exponentials of those log preds. Okay. We can go ahead and run a little model. Right. And then we need to decide if the model is any good. So one thing we can do here is we can make some sort of output data frame to store some things in. So you have train dot copy we're going to go ahead and say df of our lasso estimate is df of our lasso estimate is going to be our prediction in this case we're going to go ahead and kind of write it all out in one line here so it's the exponential of the model prediction on the training set itself and we can go ahead and just do a quick manual check here. So you run this. We can see and compare the price to the last estimate. And actually we should because we've transformed the sales price, we should go ahead and just leave this as the log. It's a little easier to look at. And we can see how well we're comparing our the actual sales price to the estimated sales price in this transformed unit. And we can go a little bit further too and build a little scatter plot for ourselves. Scatter plot of check sale price versus check lasso estimate. And we can see that we have some sort of scatter plot of how well things are doing. And you can do the transformations. So go ahead just for completeness sake. MP up exponential of both. If you want these back in the original units of price. And we can see how the model is doing in a very broad sense. Now from here, there's a huge amount of places to go. First of all, this is just a very crude look at how all the model is doing. So we see at a glance, yeah, there's pretty good correlation between the actual price and the predicted price. But we also see some like high flying outliers here that are very strange indeed, something that's worth investigating. So what's next here is to say, how do you want to evaluate this system? How do you dig into this system? And the best you can do really is evaluate different models, try different things out, try playing around with choices of continuous variable versus categorical variable, see how it moves things around, and spend some time looking for problems. I already showed one problem where there was an inconsistency between the basement square footage and the fact that there is or is not a basement according to the basement exposure variable. Likewise, if you actually look at some of these outliers, you'll find that there are some values that just don't quite make sense. Now, having a large error for a specific point in the model may mean the model's wrong, but sometimes it also means that the data could be wrong. So it's worth investigating those points to say, is this a model issue or is this something wacky with the data? Did somebody have a typo when they put in the sales price by you know, putting an extra digit in there and so it's off by a factor of 10? These kind of problems are the problems you run into in real life data.
things aren't clean. You get weird, messy results. And you have to figure out how are you going to identify what the problems are. And the short answer is it's just going to be a lot of manual investigation. And you mainly investigate things that you find suspicious. And the more time you're willing to invest in looking at things and finding those errors, the more errors you'll find, the more things you can correct. And you're never going to be 100% confident that a model is perfect, that the data is perfectly clean. But you can be confident that you found all the obvious bugs. One place that can be very helpful, actually, is building very simple models. It's always in vogue to build the biggest, craziest, deepest machine learning neural network you can. But a lot of times, if you build something like a simple logistic regression model, besides giving you a nice baseline, it'll also point out things that are oddly suspicious in the data. So how is it that an incredibly simple model can get most of the data right, but it only gets these two points wrong? It's not doing anything complicated enough to really distinguish those two points. It's somehow this is happening. Now, it could be that these points are just that different, that they are totally unique, strange values, and that the model just fails utterly. Or it could be that they are broken. Now, you can't default to one answer or the other. You can't say, oh, it's an outlier, throw it out. Absolutely do not do that. But what an outlier is in the data, especially for a simple model, is something that demands investigation. It demands saying, is there a typo here? Does this data even make sense? Or is something just fundamentally wrong? So from here, I encourage you to take this data set, spend some more time looking at it, figure out why there's some weirdly outlying points here, figure out what other hidden errors and gems there are to discover, and then try fitting some basic models to it. it. Turns out this is actually a pretty messy data set on the whole. There's a lot of things to find, and it's good practice in dealing with that kind of insanity of the mess. Doing good modeling isn't about the models often. It's often about looking at the data and knowing the data and understanding the data. If you don't understand the data, you can't build good models on it. And instead, you'll be blindly accepting things like this or inconsistencies in the input that make no sense and trying to make a model fit by just changing parameters. When in fact, the underlying data is the thing that's going to drive the success or failure of most models out there. Thanks for watching. And a special thanks to those whose contributions help fund and sustain creating content like this. As always, the code produced today is available on GitHub through a link in the description. Remember to like, subscribe, push all the buttons, click all the things, and I'll see you next time.